This conference will now be recorded. Okay, good morning, everybody. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, we'll start off with the class today. It's a small topic on laser photocoagulation and cryotherapy. This is mostly a most commonly used therapeutic modality in ophthalmology as far as retinal problems are concerned. So what does this laser photocoagulation do what is the, the mechanism of action how does it uh, prevent the further deterioration of the clinical condition this is what you have to have a just idea uh, a small i will be giving you a small briefing about it and uh, you have to know basically what is the mechanism of action of this laser photocoagulation and how does it prevent the progression of the disease or how does it prevent the worsening of the disease uh, what is the mechanism of its action? What are the different types of lasers used in ophthalmology? And uh, when exactly is the indication of cryotherapy? All these we'll be just discussing today. So let's start off with the topic. So what is laser photocoagulation? Uh, before under trying to understand that, we have to first understand what is laser? Laser is nothing but light amplification and by stimulated emis emission of radiation. So that is the expansion of the word laser, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Okay, so now there, there are, what is this laser basically? If you see this picture here, what do you see here? If you see uh, the, there is a, a cavity here, you can see a cavity here. And there are mirrors here. One mirror is here and one mirror is here. Here, this mirror is partially reflecting mirror and this mirror is a total total reflecting mirror. And uh, this is this yellow color zone is the light. 
through the light which light which is passed through optical pumping and in between in within the cavity there is a medium so every medium it could be a solid liquid or gas so there is a medium there is a this is a box or a cavity this is a highly simplified explanation of how laser works so what is the, what is the initial stage so if you fill this cavity with gas it has few electrons or you know, atoms it has few atoms so now what does it do uh, it normally it is in this particular state so there is a partially reflecting mirror and there, there is a total re reflecting mirror and when you pass a light through either uh, electric electrical stimulation or any other method when you pump light these electrons get excited so when they get uh, when there is an optical pumping is on these electrons which from its normal position they get excited and once you stop the optical pumping of light uh, then they come back to their normal state from the excited state when they come back to the normal state from the excited state they emit radiation so that emitted radiation is nothing but laser so that is nothing but which is amplified by the mirror you can see here there is a mirror on either side it goes on reflect getting reflected there and that uh, right that energy which is released when the uh, come back to their uh, resting state they emit radiation which is amplified the, by reflection of the mirror so this uh, is highly precise the beam of light which uh, different types of wavelength and different types of medium produce different uh, types of laser light so what are the different types we come across that we'll be discussing now so the, basically a laser uh, machine contains three parts there is a medium that is laser medium that which is present within the cavity which is uh, bordered by mirrors which one is which is partially reflecting mirror and the second one is totally reflecting mirror then the exciting methods for exciting the atoms or the molecules in the medium you can use light or electricity so this is here light is used which excites the atoms within the medium so then there is optical cavity or the laser tube around which the medium which acts as a resonator so this optical cavity is nothing but or these mirrors the electrons or the atoms or the molecules they resonate within the uh, medium so that gives rise to the amplification of the light when they are uh, when the electricity is removed or when the excitation is removed they come back to hit their normal position so what is the difference between a light and a laser to understand that, uh, you have to first uh, try to understand basic difference between the light. So light, here it is, laser is a stimulated emission. And this is a spontaneous emission. When you switch on a, in the switch, the, you can see the light glowing. So that is spontaneous emission from the, from the particular instrument or the bulb or a tube light. So you can see the light or you can take the natural light from the sun and uh, or, or it is even the light is visible it is within the visible spectrum visible spectrum is between 400 to 700 nanometers here the laser is a stimulated emission when you stimulate the medium the excited electrons of the atoms of the molecules they get excited and they come back to their normal position after you remove the stimulation so during that time the emitted radiation is nothing but laser it is monochromatic means a particular monochromatic means a particular wavelength only is present so it could be 830 nanometers or 560 nanometers or 512 nanometers like that different one particular wavelength only is present whereas light is polychromatic you have all the different colors in the visible spectrum with gr colors are there each one has different wavelengths so it is polychromatic polychromatic means violet indigo and so on the vipgr colors are present and laser is a highly energized light whereas normal light which we come across in our rooms is a poorly energized poorly energized light parallelism is right is present and highly divergence and this light is highly divergent parallelism means you can shoot the laser light exactly at a precise point where you want so that is the advantage of laser whereas light if you throw a light it it does not go to a particular it gets diverged it does not 
it will eliminate the whole room but it is not very precise unless you use some mechanism which you where you can shoot the light in one particular area so coherence coherence means and non coherent coherent means they follow a particular beam and they, each wavelength each beam of light they, they follow a particular pattern and it is highly sharply focused whereas light is not coherent and it is not sharply focused so this is the basic difference laser is highly precise form of light which is energized form of light of a particular wavelength only that is laser so this is what you have to understand what is laser why can't we use an ordinary light why, why do we have to use a laser so now coming to the classifications of various types of lasers we saw a medium is required for production of laser for excitation so the mediums various mediums are solid state metal vapor dye excimer laser diode laser gas laser different types of mediums are present in solid state we have ruby nd yard laser rpm yard laser in metal vapor we have copper and gold dye we have rhodamine excimer we have argon fluoride krypton uh, krypton fluoride and krypton chloride no each type of this wavelength each type of this laser has its own application for example if you take excimer laser its application is in lasik refractive surgery refractive surgery is nothing but we do when we do a refractive surgery say for example a patient undergoes lasik or lasik or femtosecond laser or uh, what is the type of laser we are using we are using an excimer laser because it has less penetration into the eye and it is mainly it uh, limited to the gets absorbed at the corneal level suppose we are using a, you are doing a opening in the posterior capsule of the lens that is then you use nd yard laser so if you want to burn the retina you use argon laser so different types of lasers have different applications so diode laser is nothing but gallium and aluminum combination arsenide laser is also an example of diode laser so these are the different types of lasers we come across so this laser delivery can be in two forms which is commonly used one is called as pulsed laser and one is called as continuous form so pulsed laser means you give it in aliquots aliquots means say uh, you, there is a, if you let me give you an example uh, for example you want to take a curry from a bowl you take you can either take pour the whole bowl into your plate or you can take small small spoons the effect is the same ultimately the whole bowl is uh, is uh, emptied into the plate so some something something like that uh, what we do is pulsed laser is nothing but it is an energy delivered in brief bursts and it has more power and example for that is nd yard laser and excimer laser so you give in form of shots whereas continuous laser is nothing but the laser as uh, are um, not in a form of small small shots they are uh, delivered in a continuous fashion onto the retina so argon laser krypton laser diode lasers and dye lasers are such examples for the same now if you see the wavelength of the light this is the visible spectrum what we uh, we call it, call it as the visible light you can see here the colors of the laser depends upon the spectrum where they exactly are present see excimer laser has a wavelength of 193 so the greater the wavelength the more the penetration so if you see here this is 193 which is used for refractive surgery if you see this laser nd yard laser in, in this double frequency nd yard laser which is a 2 into nd yard which is green in color this is used mainly for retina where problems in retina like diabetic retinopathy and so on so different types of lasers are applied in different clinical conditions so if you want to treat some uh, choroidal level lesion which requires more penetration you can use nd uh, you can use diode laser these are in the infrared range this is in the ultraviolet range 
this is in the visible spectrum range most of the lasers are in visible spectrum range except for excimer laser and this ndr laser which is uh, and diode laser which is outside the visible spectrum range. this is in the infrared range this is in the ultraviolet range so if you see this picture you uh, if you remember this picture you can guess what is the wavelength so here when the wavelength is less the penetration into the eye is very poor so it doesn't penetrate beyond the cornea so that is why this these types of lasers are very useful for refractive surgeries like uh, myopia hypermetropia astigmatism you want to do some refractive surgery such lasers are very helpful and if you want to treat the retina you can use the laser between this range 570 to uh, the, the, to 532 so these are green color so which i help in treatment of retina now coming to effect of laser on the eye so when you are throwing laser on the eye what happens hemoglobin so hemoglobin is nothing but uh, these are the pigments which are present in the eye so these pigments have definite absorption of a particular wavelength of light so this hemoglobin absorbs green uh, green uh, pigments so argon green is absorbed are found to be useful to coagulate the blood vessels so when uh, if you use green laser why should we use green laser for treatment of diabetic retinopathy so this uh, green laser is absorbed by hemoglobin pigment which is present in the uh, which is present which is present in the uh, blood vessels um, so xanthophyll pigment is nothing but which is present in inner and outer plexiform layers of the retina so even present in the inner and outer plexiform layers of the macula maximum absorption is blue is blue and argon blue is not recommended to treat macular lesion so this xanthophyll pigment which is there which is present mainly in the inner and outer plexiform layers of the macula so this macula the if you apply the blue laser its absorption is maximum if you want to treat macula but it has its own and disastrous effect so it is not used so xanthophyll pigment uh, because in, in the macular tissue laser it will it can cause permanent loss of vision melanin melanin is mainly present in rpe and choroid so for that you can use argon blue or krypton laser so in a pan retinal focalization photocoagulation or destruction of rpe you can use this type of laser so hemoglobin xanthophyll melanin so these three are the pigments which absorb light so the effect is maximum when you apply green laser on hemoglobin where is hemoglobin present in the blood vessels so whenever there is a leakage in blood vessels in case of diabetic retinopathy if you apply uh, argon green laser the effect it is quite effective xanthophyll pigment is nothing but present in inner and outer plexiform layers of the macula where blue is more effective it have absorbs maximum blue in color so if the lesion is uh, in the macula then blue laser actually is more effective melanin is where uh, uh, which is black in color so in rpa and for that argon and krypton is more effective so you have to select the type of the laser based on the level of the lesion where the lesion is it is at the level of the blood vessels or is it at the level of rpe or choroid so because each one has different types of uh, or spectrum of absorption of wavelength of light so that you have to apply that particular uh, wavelength of light for for its treatment to coagulate that particular lesion so what are the effects of laser so laser uh, has mainly three effects on the tissue first one is thermal effect second one is photochemical effect third one is ionizing effect so what is this thermal effect thermal effect is nothing but it is it includes photocoagulation so what what happens in photocoagulation it just makes the tissue uh, it burns the tissue there and uh, coagulates it so photo disruption is nothing but it is in the infrared range uh, this photocoagulation light, as I said, said, it is around 532 nanometers, which is within the visible spectrum of the light. So you can see the light when it is being applied. But when it is uh, photo disruption, it is in the infrared range. You cannot see the laser light, but it does its effect. It just goes and blasts the tissues. So that is photo disruption. Photo vaporization is another example of the same. And 
what are the photochemical effects what are the photo photochemical photochemical effects so these are photo radiation and photo ablation if you use the excimer laser it does nothing but photo ablation that is in 193 nanometers it causes ablation that it uh, vaporizes of uh, it converts the stromal tissue into a vaporized form and uh, you cannot see that so it just ablates the stromal tissue and thins the cornea so photo radiation and photo ablation are the effects of laser effects or the photochemical effects of laser on the tissue ionizing effects is the third variety which is commonly which is not commonly used in ophthalmology but these are the main clinical effects of laser on the eye photocoagulation photo disruption photo ablation these three are mainly used so basically you have three effects that is thermal photochemical and ionizing effect in thermal we have coagulation disruption and vaporization in photochemical we have photo radiation and photo ablation ablation is used mainly for lasik uh, or uh, refractive surgeries this is mainly photo disruption is mainly used for yak capsulotomies and photocoagulation is mainly used in cases of diabetic retinopathy to burn the retina now if you see this picture here this is an example of laser photocoagulation you can see here there are leaking uh, there are uh, uh, neovascularizations which are present in the retina the laser is being applied there to coagulate the retina so what does the laser beam do it passes through the contact lens and it up, it gets applied on to the retina once it is applied on to the retina it coagulates the retina so that prevents the further leakage now what is the effect of lasers other than where else you can use the lasers other than um, retina so you can this is one examples uh, you can see here laser pupillary movement in updrawn pupil so you can this is one example laser burns to stretch the updrawn updrawn pupil if your pupil is updrawn here you can give laser burns to stretch the updrawn pupil laser pupillometry as is in rigid pupil so you can just if the pupil is not getting dilated you can use lasers for the same so in the trabecular meshwork where you do uh, in cases of uh, open angle glaucomas where uh, there is a raised iop there is something called as arcane laser trabeculoplasty or selective laser trabeculoplasty you can make laser openings in the trabecular meshwork for the outflow of the aqueous humor so these are other uses in the in ophthalmology where you can use laser now this is an example of laser photocoagulation you can see the burns in the retina you can see these are, these are fresh burns and these are old burns they coagulate the tissue like that and they form scarring and this is an example of an horseshoe tear where you do a barrage laser you can see here this is a predisposing factor for retinal detachment uh, which, where to prevent retinal detachment occurring in future you can give a barrage laser around the horseshoe tear to prevent retinal detachment so as a prophylactic treatment also you can use laser so the lesions of retina and choroid where you can use laser include diabetic retinopathy retinal vascular diseases choroidal neovascularization clinically significant macular edema central serous retinopathy retinal break or detachment tumors so these are the different lesions where you can use uh, lasers in the eye so these are few examples where and um, the lasers are applied or uh, there are applications of lasers in the eye now coming to the next topic that is cryotherapy so till now we have discussed lasers and its application its mechanism of action and how does it function now we will discuss what is cryotherapy cryopexy or cryotherapy means to produce tissue injury by application of intense cold between 40 degrees celsius to 100 degrees celsius what does this cryo do cryo just freezes the tissue and destroys the tissue so whenever a tissue is destroyed uh, whenever a tissue is freezed to its maximum extent the circulation is hampered and the tissue gets destroyed so it is irreversible destruction uh, irreversible phenomena there is uh, once it is destroyed it does not recover so what is the application of this cryotherapy in the eye so you can see there are various types of probes which are used in 
cryotherapy. So these are the different uh, uh, types of probes which have different applications in the eye based on the probe width you apply in different, seas, different areas. Some can, earlier when the ICE was done, they used to uh, hold the lens with the cryo probe and deliver the lens outside through the scleral incision or the limbal incision. And uh, if you want to apply, if the patient has a refractory glaucoma where the IOP is not coming down in spite of all your treatments, then we can apply cryotherapy on the ciliary body where there is production of aqueous humor, which can be decreased by application of cryotherapy by destroying the ciliary body. So what is the principle of cryotherapy? Uh, it is based on the Joel Thompson's principle of cooling. So what a cryo unit contains of uh, freon, nitrous oxide or carbon dioxide gas as a cooling agent. The cryo probes which are available in different sizes such as one millimeter for intravitreal use, 1.5 straight or curved probe for cataract extraction, 2.5 mm for retina, 4, 4, 4, 4 mm for cyclocryopexy. So these are the different sizes which are available. So this can be used for lens extraction. This can be used for used for retina or cryocyclocryopexy. What is the mode of action of this cryotherapy? There are the main mode of action of this cryotherapy is tissue necrosis additions, which within the retina, RP and choroid, because it induces inflammation and creates addition between the retina and RP, vascular occlusions in cases of uh, uh, quartz uh, disease and um, adherence in case of cataract extraction. So basically, what does cryo do? It just freezes the tissue. Once it freezes the tissue, it destroys the tissue. So that causes tissue necrosis. It induces adhesions. It causes vascular occlusions. And it, um, it can be used to remove the cataract. But this procedure of cataract extraction is no more done nowadays. It was the earlier procedure which was followed when ICC was done, intracapsular cataract extraction. But uh, you have to know its historical importance for uh, as few examiners might ask you. What are the other uses? Other than the uses which I mentioned there, there are some uses like for trichiasis, for what? basal cell carcinoma or hemangioma cryotherapy can be used. In conjunctiva, if there are hypertrophic papillae, as in case of vernal keratoconjunctivitis, uh, this cryotherapy can be applied. In ciliary body, and when cases where IOP is very high, like in cases of absolute glaucoma or neovascular glaucoma, you can use this cryo. So basically, cryo is usually a last uh, um, uh, resort in cases of uh, glaucoma where it is absolute glaucoma or neovascular glaucoma where there is no vision salvageable uh, and you want to decrease the intraocular pressure, you can go for cryotherapy. And uh, if hypertrophic papillae are present in cases of uh, VKC, there also cryotherapy can be applied. And uh, in cases of lid lesions like basal cell carcinoma, warts, or trichiasis, cryotherapy can be applied. So in brief, I have just covered about what is the laser, what is the mechanism of action, how does it act, where, what are the pigments which absorb laser, and what are the clinical applications of laser. And uh, I have also covered what is cryotherapy. You have to just know the indications of laser, types of laser, and indications of cryo types of, uh, uh, sorry, indications of cryo and mechanism of action of this laser and cryo. It is given in your textbook. This is not so important topic as far as your exams are concerned, but you might get a few short note, uh, very short uh, note uh, questions on this particular topic, like uh, right to applications of cryotherapy or like uh, right to applications of laser in uh, ophthalmology, something like that. You can get a, a very short note question is possible in cases of your theory paper. It, it is better to have a small idea or a brief idea about these things so that you don't miss or miss out on this particular topic. So with this, I complete this class. If you have any questions, you can ask. No questions?
Okay, thank you.